Nestle's Ever Ready, the instant cocoa. Nestle's Quick for great chocolate milk. And Nestle's Chocolate Bars present Space Patrol. High adventure in the wild, vast reaches of space. Missions of daring in the name of interplanetary justice. Travel into the future with Buzz Corey, Commander-in-Chief of the Space Patrol. In today's transcribed Space Patrol adventure, Buzz and Abby have just rescued two men from a damaged space freighter. Right now in their spaces, they're helping the two men through the airlock into the Space Patrol ship. Close the hatch, Abby. Yes, sir. And we can raise our face pieces now. That will take you back after. Thanks. Thanks. I've got something in this box that'll make it feel better. Oh, first aid kit, huh? Not quite. And if it all gets your hands up, you'll need more than first aid. Commander, it's a blast gun. We're taking over the ship. Boy, do as you're told and you stay alive. We'll return in just a moment with today's exciting space patrol adventure, The Voice from the Future. It's hot stuff. What's hot stuff? Nestle's Ever Ready Cocoa. That's hot stuff. That's what I said. Nestle's Ever Ready Cocoa is hot stuff. So what are we arguing about? I have stopped mixing me up. There's no argument about Nestle's Ever Ready because everybody agrees it makes the most wonderful cup of hot chocolate in the universe. You said a mouthful, Captain Tufel. Nestle's makes such a rich, chocolatey, delicious hot chocolate, it's out of this world. And there's no mixing up either because Nestle's Ever Ready practically makes itself. That's right. All you do is put one, two, three teaspoons of Nestle's Ever Ready in your cup, you add hot water, and it's made. You don't have to add milk or sugar because Nestle's is complete. Yes, Nestle's has rich whole milk and sugar already in it. And you know something? What I like best about Nestle's is that sensational Nestle's flavor. There's nothing quite like it. It's real chocolatey, too. A terrific treat any time of day or night. Glad you mentioned that, Hat, because we always recommend hot chocolate made with Nestle's for a breakfast warm-up. But we also like to see space patrollers drink it at all their meals and snacks, too. Uh, uh, now, what did you say was the name of this product? Oh, Hap, you're kidding me again. You know it couldn't be anything but Nestle's Ever Ready Cocoa. In the bright red can. That's Nestle's. And it's hot stuff. And now, today's Space Patrol adventure, The Voice from the Future. Commander Corey and Cadet Happy have just arrived at the lunar fleet base on the Earth's moon. They're on a mission so secret that not even Happy knows the purpose of their rapid space flight from Terra to the solar system's most closely guarded test base. Right now, in an office reserved for the commander at the lunar fleet base, Buzz slides open a large metal cabinet revealing a panel covered with a maze of instruments, control levers, gauges, and switches. There you are, Happy. What do you think? Wow, it's wonderful. A model of a rocket cockpit. Mm-hmm. It's a mock-up of the control section of a new rocket ship. Well, you don't mean the new star drive job, uh, the big hush-hush operation? That's it. Project Infinity has been completed. Or it will be as soon as you make a pass. Project Infinity. So that's what the code name stands for, the new star drive patrol ship. Well, uh, uh, when do we blast off? The engineers are making a final inspection now. Rather than get in their way, I thought I'd give you a special briefing on this model. Oh, well, sure need it. It looks different from the star drive control we've been using. Yes, sir. This is a multi-purpose ship. It can be used for regular patrols in our solar system as well as for interstellar travel. Oh, this cockpit has got everything. Use scope, spacophone, decoders, hyperspace computers. Yes, anti-gravity controls and ultra-sensitive radiation indicators. We're prepared for almost anything you'll encounter anywhere in space. I'll say. You know, I just noticed those atomic cannon controls. Uh, how far are we going to take this flight tonight? The Alpha Centauri, a little over four light years away. One thing I've been wondering about, though, why all this secrecy? We don't have to worry about any trouble from Toronto anymore. Well, we can't be sure that some of the solar system doesn't have spies here in the United States. Uh-oh. Something's happened that I haven't heard about. I can tell by your tones, sir. Yes, sir. There's already been an attempt to steal the hyperspace drive designs. Fortunately, the attempt was foiled. We don't know whether the thief is from one of our planets or from another solar system. Well, maybe some Tyrannian spies are still here and don't know that their attack plans are all washed up. Uh, whoever's responsible, we can't afford to take chances. Let's go over this rocket cockpit model in detail, and we'll be ready for the real test. Elsewhere in the office of the Red Star Space Lines in Lowell City on the planet Mars, Rourke Dexter leans back in his chair and stares dreamily at the huge space chart on the wall. Behind Dexter, the door opens, and Nate Soren shambles in and settles his huge frame in the only remaining chair. Oh. Something wrong, sir? 
something wrong, he says. I just made my last flight for Red Star. I'm out of a job. And working for Red Star is no recommendation. I'll be lucky to get a job shipping paint. Trouble with you, Thorin, is you're always looking on the dark side of things. What other side is there? Things are as black as... That was that space chart. Come on. There goes our last chip. When it sets down to Jupiter City, that light will blink out. You will be operations chief of a grounded fleet. Those old traitors have served their purpose. They sure have, Mister, and so have you. I just hope you made a fortune out of hijacking cargo from other outfits. You're going to have to live on it for a long time. Soren, how would you like to continue working for me? <laughs> Doing what? The only thing you know, spaceship. <laughs> We're going back into the shipping business. Under a different name, I suppose. Now, that's right. The space patrol will get on to us in no time. They wouldn't do them any good. They'll never be able to catch us. You're crazy. They caught us before, didn't they? That's why we're both out of a job, remember? Sorry. Right. Listen. We're going to have an interstellar ship with star drive. We make our deliveries through hyperspace. Oh, I know you're crazy. Who am I? Listen to this. Corey's going to test one of those new star drive ships. He's at the Lunar Fleet Base right now. I'll have to find that out. Oh, I, I have very good sources of information. I almost got a copy of the designs of the new rocket cockpit. When my agent failed, I got the idea of stealing the ship itself. It's much better. It saves us the time and expense of building one of our own. What's my cut? 25% of our profit. And that's pretty good for a pilot. And you don't take the risk you did under the old setup. Well, all of a sudden, this is beginning to make sense. Of course. And as I say, there's no risk. Once you cut into hyperspace, the space patrol can never trail you. The big question now is, how do we get that new ship away from the space patrol? I've got it all figured out. The test vector is supposed to be top secret. But I picked up a little information. And here's the way we know. Meantime, back at the Lunar Fleet Base, Buzz and Happy are in the rocket cockpit of the new Star Drive ship, all set to blast off. Manicori aboard test ship SD-1, calling Lunar Space Control. Space Control Lunar here, Commander. Request space lock clearance for immediate blast off. Space lock number three, ready as ordered, sir. Space lock three confirmed. Corey out. Set magnetic compensator for space lock three, huh? Yes, sir. <laughs> Five seconds. Three seconds. Fire rocket. This rate over beyond the Jupiter orbit. Then we'll increase to attain star drive velocity near Neptune. Uh-oh. Man, could you scope the space ship? Mm-hmm. Look at the cargo ship, sir. What are they doing clear out here? They have to be in free form. I don't see any rocket flying. What do we do? Can we it? For all the trouble we took to make a nice private test, some old hot flung is along. Yes, that will give them a wide berth. Five starboard rockets. Yes, sir. Cargo ship JF-307 calling Space Patrol. Emergency. Emergency? Is that him? Get the Space Patrol and fix the call the answer. Cargo ship JF-307 calling Space Patrol ship now 10 DUs off our starboard. Emergency. Yes, sir, it's him. And he's calling us. I don't know what his trouble is. It's not too serious, but we're to keep it at the control unit. Space Patrol, a cargo ship JF-307. What's your difficulty? We're badly damaged. Our power's out. We've got to abandon ship. We're in spacesuits now. Can you hold out in free fall until a tow ship gets here from Jupiter? We're in a real spot. My partner's injured, and we're taking a lot of radiation. Radiation? Yes. Something went wrong with our reactor shielding. What happened? The meteor hit you? Worse. Sabotage. We'll get you off that ship right away. How many are aboard? Two. My partner and I. And he's injured? Yes, but he can walk. Look, the radiation counts way above the danger point. It'll take you several minutes to maneuver into position. We'll make it as fast as we can. Oh, wait. Have you got a space raft aboard? Yes, I was just about to suggest it. Fine. You get your friend aboard the raft and get away from your ship. Even a few hundred yards will cut down the radiation count considerably. Hurry, hurry out. Well, Hap, we're going to have to lay out. We've got to see that those men get medical attention as soon as possible. We'll take them. Bring out a couple of spaces, Hap. We have to help that injured man into the airlock. 
A few moments later, Buzz decelerates the spaceship as he sights the tiny space raft floating away from the damaged cargo ship under the propulsion of compressed air from the jet pack. With rockets cut off, Buzz and Happy stand in the airlock of their ship, looking through the open hatch as the raft maneuvers closely. Commander Corey, the space raft. Can you read me? Yes, Commander. Accelerate with your forward jet pack. It'll save your pal a rough bump. Sure. Raft is secured, sir. The magnetic field is holding it steady. Is your partner conscious? Yes, but he's pretty weak. We'll help him aboard. Uh, come on, pal. On your feet. Ah, we're safe now. That's it. I've got his arm. There you go. Have steady him while I help the other one. I can manage fine, thanks. You better let me take that box to you aboard. It's okay, just some personal effects. All right, close the hatch, Hap. Let's get into the ship. Yes, sir. I'll get the inner hatch. Okay, we can raise our face pieces now. Well, the cadet will take you back after you can get out of those space suits. Uh, Hap, that injured man is pretty weak. Better hold him. Yes, sir. I've got something in this box that'll make him feel better. Oh, first aid kit, huh? Not quite. If you don't get your hands up, you'll need more than first aid. Commander, it's a blast gun. You're taking over the ship, Corey. Just obey orders. You'll find it's a simple way to stay alive. We'll return to Space Patrol in just a moment. Now hear this, Space Patrollers. The most important announcement we have ever made. <laughs> Right now, today, you can get a model of the Rocket Cockpit, a scientific, accurate scale model of the new Star Drive patrol ship called Project Infinity. It's the very one Commander Corey and Cadet Happy are testing in this exciting adventure. Gang, listen to this. Your model Rocket Cockpit has everything the real one has, a big moving viewscope that shows you all the major planets and tells you their names. You can send and decode secret messages with the master coders. They have a system that will be known only to space patrollers. And you'll get a big bang out of the sensational atomic cannons. They have real sighting mechanisms. And you can fire projectiles accurately from Porter's starboard side. You'll control gravity with the thrust handles that govern special rocket mechanisms. And you'll be able to set the special time computers to star drive. The secret invention that takes you through time at heretofore unbelievable speeds. Yes, gang, your model rocket cockpit has all these moving parts and plenty of other dials, computers, and control devices. And it's so real looking, you'll feel you're in your own ship having all kinds of exciting adventures for yourself and your pals. Your rocket cockpit stands more than a foot high, almost two feet wide, and it has nine moving controls. And there'll be lots more fun for you if you can follow along in your rocket cockpit and receive the secret messages the commander will be sending out from time to time. Now, I'm sure that every one of you listening today will want to send for your very own rocket cockpit. So, here's what you do. Send your name and address and 25 cents in coin, plus two wrappers from any size Nestle's chocolate bars, to Nestle, Box 54, St. Louis, Missouri. Again, it's your name and address and 25 cents in coin, plus wrappers from any two Nestle's chocolate bars, to Nestle, Box 54. 54, St. Louis, Missouri. And hurry, fellas and girls, don't miss a minute of the fun of owning your very own rocket cockpit. And now, back to our space patrol adventure, The Voice from the Future. Buzz and Happy are making a test flight of a new star drive ship when they're hailed by a cargo ship claiming to have been sabotaged. Leaving the two occupants of the cargo vessel to be in danger of radiation from the damaged ship, Buzz orders them to launch a space raft and leave the wreck. The space patrollers pull the two men aboard their ship, whereupon one of the men suddenly produces a blast gun from a metal box he's carrying. As he orders Buzz and Happy to raise their hands, the other man, supposedly injured, briskly steps forward. Keep them covered, sir. Walk next. Yes, Commander. By the way, I owe you something for putting the red star line out of operation. You did that yourself by your crooked method. I am back in business, Corey. As of this minute. Let's not stick around here too long, Dexter. We've got to make Corey get us away from here. We will need him to operate the regular rocket drive. Besides, there is probably a technical manual aboard if we get stuck. 
In fact, I think all you do to cut in the rockets is press this lever. You got it! That'll get us far out of space. We'll look up Corey and the cadet and try to figure out that star drive. I'm warning you, Dexter. Don't play around with that hyperspace drive. It involves the kind of arithmetic where two and two don't always make four. I can figure it out. And if I get stuck, I'll make you give us a hand. Yeah, you'd be surprised, Corey, what Dexter and I already know about the star drive. Okay. You'd be surprised at what you don't know about. Soren, march him back aft and lock him up. I'm going to get this ship into hyperspace before Corey's outfit starts searching for him. Locked in an aft compartment of the ship, Buzz and Happy are helpless as Dexter and Soren fumble with the star drive controls. You think you'll be able to work it, sir? We might hit on the right procedure just by chance. Maybe one of the other ships will come along looking for us when we don't report back. We're going to stop Dexter. They better do it before he stumbles onto the star drive. They've hit the combination. We're going into star drive. The yarn up the peak rocket velocity. I'm blacking out. So am I. I bet they are too. If we come to first, maybe we can break out of here. Under the stress of a sudden transition from regular three-dimensional space to hyperspace, Buzz and Happy lose consciousness. Then, as they lie on the deck of the compartment, they dimly become aware of the strange pulsations of a hyperspace drive. For what seems like hours, they're unable to move. Even their minds are sluggish, unable to concentrate. At last, Buzz struggles to his feet and tugs at Happy. Come on, Happy. Have to stop on. It's sort of strange. Like I'm half dreaming. Well, we've got to find out what's going on up in the rocket cup. We're still in star drives from the sound of them. Yes. I've never been in hyperspace this long before. Not even when we made that half million light year trip seven weeks ago. Let's see if we can get that compartment door open. Yes, sir. <coughs> well, one thing about this ship, it's built strong. Now, hold it, man. Somebody's unlocking the door. I'll be in guard. Maybe we can overpower them now. Corey! Sorry. Corey! I've got him, Commander. Corey, help. Get Dexter. He's... Something's wrong with Sorin. It's wrong. That's just going crazy. The ship, it's out of control. Captain, I drag him in here. Yes, sir. We're locking up. We'll get up to the cockpit. Hurry. That's not just standing there. Staring at the controls with his back to us. Okay. We still have that blaster. All right, Corey. Take it easy. I got you covered. Got yourself in a fine nest, Dexter. Are you going to get me out? Fix the star drive. Go on, get busy. What did you do to your pal, Soren? Uh, he went off his rocket. I had to lock him. Where is he? He's locked up back in. He said you were crazy. Tell me what's wrong. Everything's black outside the ship. No stars, nothing. Just pitch blackness. It's the way it always is in hyperspace. You're in another dimension. Light doesn't register. There's some light. I saw it. Flashes of blue and violet. Real mixed up and crazy. Hurry. You got to get us out of this. Just keep under control. I'll take a look at the hyperspace computer. Are these instruments exactly as you first set them up? I, uh, no. I, I blacked out. And when I came to, that blackness out there got me worried, so I started turning the dial. Oh, you really messed things up. You aren't supposed to change a thing while the ship's in hyperspace. It throws us clear off vector. Hey, you can fix it. You got to. Look, there are millions of possible combinations of settings. We might spend the rest of our lives in hyperspace trying to find a setting that would bring us out in regular space. Well, don't stand there talking. Do something. Remember, Dexter, we're in this fix because you were doing something. I couldn't help it. The darkness and then those flashes and the voices. Those voices were the worst of all. Voices? What voices? From the space phone. It was gibberish and strange. Jowls. They about drove me out of my mind. I cut them off. I didn't think a space phone would work in hyperspace. Ordinarily it won't. But Dexter has things so messed up, we'll try Rockets. Where did that come from? No way to tell. Evidently, some space phone signals filter through and slits like those flashes of light. Yeah, but from where? That sound certainly wasn't from our solar system. Hap, I think we're on some sort of spiral in hyperspace. We're whirling round and round. Pull us out of it. There's no way to tell what direction to go, either in time or space. 
There's another signal, sir. Expect the agreement to have a beneficial effect on world commerce. Commander, it's English. Yes, New York City. Four Australian swimming champions arrived here today and immediately plunged into the final phase of training for the Olympic Games. Hey, it's a newscast. Officials of the Olympic Committee are confident that world records will be broken this year in track and field events as well as in other sports. Well, that's funny. There aren't One any Olympic Games this certain. year. More athletes will compete in the 1972 Olympic Games than any similar event in history. You say 1972? That's what it sounded like, right. but I don't... I've just been handed a special bullet. White Sands Proving Grounds, New Mexico. A three-stage rocket carrying two men has landed on the moon. A radio report from across 238,000 miles of space states that both men are safe. There are no details at present. But, friends, there's no doubt about it. The era of space travel is definitely here. We'll keep you informed of further... Hey, is that guy nuts? Why is he so excited about a rocket reaching the moon that's been going on for a thousand years? Yes, he did say 1972. And it was in October 1972 that the first man-piloted rocket reached the moon. Sure, everybody knows that. What kind of a newscast was that? All ancient history. It's a wonder he didn't tell us about Columbus. Don't you realize and... what happened? We picked up a broadcast that left Earth over a thousand years ago. What? It's our yardstick. Our measuring line. Now you're sounding crazy. Yeah, let me adjust that time computer on the rocket cockpit. Now we know our approximate position in hyperspace. We're at the distance a radio signal would travel in. Let me see, from 1972 to now, it's, it's 1,009 years. Corey, what are you going to do? I'm going to reset our hyperspace vector. If we haven't completely gummed up the works, we'll emerge back in regular space a few light years from the solar system. Nothing's happening. It's not going to work. We'll be in this crazy mixed-up space the rest of our lives. You should kick, Dexter. You were mixed up in regular space. <laughs> Commander, you've hit it. I'd have... Hold on, we're coming out of Star Drive. Command, you did it. Look through the viewpoint. Stars, hundreds of them. We're back in regular space. Where are we? Are we near the solar system? Let's check. There's Orion, Hercules. And over there is Andromeda. The solar system is about five light years in that direction. Good. Set up the computer. It'll be fairly simple this time. Hey, Commander, I've been thinking about that news broadcast that we picked up. Yes, sir. What about it? Uh, 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 that was something that happened a thousand years ago, and yet we heard it just as though it was taking place in the present. That was probably a rare freak condition in hyperspace. A leak through the space-time warp. Something we can't regulate. Well, uh, if it happened to an event in the past, could it happen to a future event? I mean, could we pick up a broadcast of next year's news? It's an interesting idea, huh? Offhand, I'd say no, but well, there's a lot we don't know about hyperspace. Quit the chatter and set up the vector. It's all set. I'll cut in the star drive. No, you don't. I'll take over from now on. I know how to operate the star drive now. Well, I don't need you. You'd better think twice, Dexter. I know what I'm doing. I'm locking you up. And when we're back in the solar system, I'm turning you over to the big boss. And who's that? You'll find out soon enough. Now get back up. I'll let four and out and lock you up. Are you sure you know how to work this star drive, Dexter? Yeah. I've been watching for the operator. I almost had it right the first time. I, uh, sorry I lost my head a while ago. I thought we were finished. Forget it. From now on, we've got nothing to worry about. Well, here we go into the star drive. <laughs> There's no blacking out. In a few seconds, we'll be back in the solar system. Say, you really have got it down. Pat. Official Space Patrol Bulletin from Terra Headquarters. Space Patrol, it's Corey's voice, but Corey's oh. back up. Attention all units to Bulletin dated October 3rd. What's going on here today? Is this Shut up! Discontinue search for Star Drive test ship and the new rocket cockpit. The ship has been returned to Lunar Fleet Base. The thieves, Rock Dexter and Nate Soren, were captured yesterday and are being held at Terra Headquarters. End of report. Corey out. What does he mean we're captured? We're right here and... Dexter, what's the matter? That was right. In hyperspace, you can pick up future broadcasts, just like you can the past. What are you talking about? We heard what is going to happen tomorrow. Somehow, Corey and the cadet are going to overpower us. Not if we fix it so they can't... 
Let's finish them now. In the locked compartment, Buzz and Happy carefully placed their inflated spacesuits in a sitting position on a bunk while listening intently for a sound at the door. Just the helmets so the face pieces are away from the door, Hap. We want the suits to look occupied, at least at first glance. Yes, sir. Do you think Dexter will call for that space phone call? I'm not sure. But we'll give him a rough joke. After what I heard a while ago, I think maybe I'd believe a future broadcast myself. Hap, get back against the wall next to the door. Here's someone. Yes, sir. There's the secret of your space phone call from the future, Dexter. Yeah. They use their suit face of them. Yeah. We'll just put an end to that. Get out of that bunk, Corey. You too, Cadet. Yeah, your little practical joke is going to prove fatal for you. Get sore and half. I'll handle that story. Uh, All right, hold the blaster on I'll go up to the cockpit to check the position. I'm not licked yet, Corey. And don't think your fake space of phone call fooled me. I knew all the time it wasn't the broadcast from the future. That was no fake, Dexter. Every word about your capture is true. That same bulletin will be space phone tomorrow, won't it, sir? Yes, Ab. Here's the ironic part of it, Dexter. You made it come true by trying to make it false. An action preview of next week's exciting Space Patrol adventure in just a moment. Say, is it true that Space Patrollers can now get models of the new rocket cockpit? That's right, Hap. We're offering every Space Patroller a model of our new rocket cockpit for his very own. Smoking rockets, Commander, that's cosmic. A model of the rocket cockpit is so real, we use it as a trainer. And it has so many moving parts, so many terrific controls. Uh, it certainly is the most exciting offer we've ever made. Space Patrollers... Your rocket cockpit is an exact model of the one in our brand new Star Drive ship. It has a big moving view scope, special gravity controls, master coder and decoder, big, powerful atomic cannons that you can actually fire, and of course, the special time drive computers that enable you to fly through time into hyperspace. Wait till you see it. It's more than a foot high and almost two feet wide. Boy, will you want to get one, and fast. Gang, here's how to get your rocket cockpit. Send your name and address and 25 cents in coin... Plus the wrappers from any two Nestle's chocolate bars to Nestle, Box 54, St. Louis, Missouri. That's Nestle, Box 54, St. Louis, Missouri. And now, a preview of next week's exciting space patrol adventure. Buzz and Happy are on Mars, searching for a special piece of electronics equipment from another solar system. A girl guides them to a room where two men are carrying a heavy instrument. Just what is that instrument, Gather? I don't know. An acquaintance asked us to get it. Set it on, Gordon. Hey, look out oh. for that chair. <laughs> How clumsy of us. It's nice to bits. Well, maybe it can be fixed. Here, I'll help you pick up the pieces. Don't bother. Get oh. Gather's. Hey. Get the girl, Gordon. I'll cover these two with a blast gun. Be sure to be with us next week for the thrilling story, Message to Artrona. On Space Patrol! Space Patrol, created by Mike Moser, starring Ed Kemmerer as Commander Corey, and Lynn Osborne as Cadet Happy, was written by Lou Houston, produced and directed by Larry Robertson, executive producer Helen Moser. Other players were Norman Jolly, Ken Mayer, and Bela Kovach. Dick Tufel speaking. Now, don't forget to tune in next Saturday and every Saturday for exciting action on Space Space Patrol! This week's Space Patrol was brought to you by Nestle's Everetti, the instant cocoa. Nestle's Quick for great chocolate milk and Nestle's Chocolate Bars. This program is broadcast to our armed forces overseas through the worldwide facilities of the Armed Forces Radio Service. Space Patrol came to you...